In part one of this series, I unbox the Ultimate 3 Whisper Transmitter Kit from QRP Labs. In this second part, we're going to build one of the low-pass filters. We'll start by winding the three small coils. Then we'll take time to talk about inductors, what they are and how they work. We'll finish up with a lesson on filters and harmonics. Stick around and we'll have some fun. I'm going to start this project by working on the low-pass filter. I read in the directions that when placing some of the other components on the main board, it's easier to position them if you already have the low-pass filter built and assembled and you can see exactly how it's going to lay on the board. You have a better way of aligning a toroid that is on the board. So we're going to build some toroids first. I think I just put everything away except for the wire and one of these toroids. The directions say there's enough wire here to make three toroids. What they want us to do is to basically cut this into three pieces and then start winding coils. Now that we've got that loose there, I'll carefully unwind this length of magnet wire to wrap this through that toroid. We have to count the number of turns. I'm going to make three of these. And I see on the notes that I need to make two of them with 21 turns. And the third one will have uh, 24 turns on it. So let me uh, come up with a dividing this up into thirds. And then we'll start winding the coil. So I kind of estimated a little bit of trial and error here. And I've divided the wire here into three sections. One section is just a little bit longer than the other two, but that's fine. We have one coil that's going to have more turns on it. I'll cut that off here. I'm going to set the, the longer one aside, and I'll come back to that. And then I have these two sections here that are about the same length. I'll just cut them there. And now I'm ready to start winding the toroid. Okay, 21 turns. So I'll just start by putting the, the toroid over the wire right there. That counts as one. Now I'm going to see how this goes. I've never done this before. I think one of the fun things that I have about doing these videos is that I don't do them because I'm some expert at anything. I do it because I'm learning how to do it myself. It's fun to learn new things. I certainly enjoy it, and I enjoy sharing them with folks. So if you're watching and you see a better way of doing it, put it in the comments so that all of us can benefit from your knowledge. I've got myself going there. I have three turns. I'll split this uh, video up so that you don't have to go through the pain of watching me do this 21 times in real time. That's four. So I can see that here's 10. With 10 coils on here, I should be halfway around. And I'm a little more than halfway around. So I'm going to start moving this a little bit. I can see that it's really easy to move them. That looks better. That was 10. I think that's 11. I'm going to double count these. So 21. And there's plenty of wire left over. So I think, we're, I think I'll do a quick count and make sure that I've got the 21 turns that it calls for. Okay, this isn't too bad for my first attempt. Taking a look at it now through the magnifying glass, I've gone through and I've counted all of my wraps around the toroid, and I've got exactly 21 of them, which is what the directions say. I'll take a few minutes now. I'll just kind of adjust the facing on these things, make it look a little even, and then I've got two more of these to build. We'll get on with that. I've got the first and third coil wound. They both have 21 turns of wire through them each. The second coil that will go in the middle of the series will have 24 turns on it. I'm going to need to be able to tell this one here, the last one that I'm going to create, from the first two. So put a little black dot here on this one with a permanent marking pin that will make it easy for me to identify that later. Winding the first three coils went fairly well. Having never done it before, I was pleasantly surprised to find that it is not at all difficult. You just keep track of your count as you go. When I got done with my second one, which was supposed to be 21 turns, I counted it and found that there were 22. That was real easy to correct. Don't be tempted to space your coils out evenly before you count them. When their spacing is irregular, it's much easier to count them because you'll notice there's a group of two 
and then there's a group of three. That was a good thing. I'm really glad that I came up with the idea of marking this center toroid with the permanent marker. This is the coil. It has 24 turns on it, and it goes in a different place on the low-pass filter. So we're ready to move on to the next part of this project. Who are these guys anyway? We've made these little coils. They come under a lot of different names. They are sometimes called inductors, chokes. Of course, they're sometimes called coils. And in certain configurations, when you have more than one wire wrapped around together, they might be called transformers. In order to understand what's really going on here, let me show you a simple thing here. Maybe when you were a kid, you took a nail and wrapped wire around it. We take like a paper clip here, and I've got a little small battery, and if I hold this right so that I connect these things up, I'll put a wire here on one end of the battery, but like that, connect it on here with the other end, and if I come down here, we have a magnet, an electromagnet. The nail has picked up the paper clip, but if I open the circuit, the paper clip falls down. The reason that works is because when we run electricity through a coil, it builds up a magnetic field around it. We have an electromagnet. The cool thing is we can do exactly the opposite. We can take a coil like this, and if we had a magnet, and we move the magnet back and forth along the side of this coil, the magnetic field of the magnet would create a flow of electrons in our wire. That's how generators work. This whole thing gets even even more interesting. Remember, when I hooked the battery up to the circle, it created a magnetic field. When we talk about moving a magnetic field next to the coil, we create electricity. When you hook power up to a coil, here's what's going on. This magnetic field expands, and as it expands, it creates a flow of electrons in the coil itself. Here's where it gets interesting. If we hook up the battery and say we have electricity flowing through our coil in this direction, the expanding magnetic field generates a flow of electricity going in the opposite direction. We call this counter EMF. EMF stands for electromotive force. We know it today by the simple word voltage because the unit of measure for electromotive force is volt. So we have current that we put in here ourselves going this direction and we've induced current coming in the opposite direction. When those collide, we essentially have no current flowing. Now, as soon as the magnetic field is fully formed and we hook it up with a DC cell like this, those lines of force stop moving and they remain fixed there and at this point the electricity is allowed to run freely through the coil. The coil passes DC and blocks AC. Our battery is just DC. Let's take a look at what might be going on if we were to put AC into this coil. The key to this is this expanding and collapsing magnetic field. With an alternating current, when we run it through this coil, as the electricity starts flowing in this direction, the counter EMF fights it and pushes it back. Once that field is built, the current flows freely. But then we reverse the flow of the current. Now our current is coming through this direction. Our magnetic field has to collapse and reform itself in the opposite polarity. As the field collapses and reforms, we are crossing our coil again, creating a counter EMF, this time going in this direction. The induced current is always trying to go in the opposite direction of the current that we've applied to the circuit. As you increase the frequency, the speed at which the field expands and collapses increases. The higher the frequency, the harder it is to move current through a coil. That's why we sometimes call them chokes. They will block higher frequencies and allow lower frequencies to get through. Well, I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea of why we have coils in our low-pass filter circuit. But there's another component that works with them, and I've laid these little guys down here right now. We have four capacitors that are part of the circuit. And what is it the capacitors are doing? The capacitor is essentially 
the opposite of the coil. Remember I said that the coil will pass DC and block AC? That's in a very, very general sense and it might help you understand it. The capacitor does the opposite. The capacitor blocks DC and passes AC. So let's take a look at the schematic and see how this plays out. Here's the actual circuit that is in the instructions that come with our transmitter kit. And you can see here we have three coils, the coils that I've already built, and we have the four capacitors. Think of these capacitors here as being connected to ground. So we have our input coming in at this end, and here at this end where the antenna will be attached, we have our output. The three coils are going to try to block higher frequencies and allow the frequency that we want, which is a lower frequency, to get through. The capacitors will be doing just the opposite thing that the inductors are doing. They're going to take higher frequencies and allow them to pass to ground and be dissipated there. The whole series works together, and with luck, only the frequency we want will reach our antenna. The capacitors and inductors resonate together to form a cutoff frequency that could be mathematically calculated. That's why the instructions are so specific about the number of turns for each toroidal coil. Well, now that I've got my coils wound, and I've got my capacitors ready here, I think it's time I put them on this board and we'll wind up this part of the project. Here's my first low-pass filter, all assembled and ready to go. I used one of my experimenting breadboards to line everything up so the pins are all straight and it also made it real easy to do the soldering. This part of the project was a little challenging because many of the connections are very close together. You'll have to be careful and watch out for solder bridges. Fortunately, some of the connections that were the closest together were also electrically tied together, so a little bit of a solder bridge there didn't matter. You need to be careful to scrape the enamel off the two ends of the winding wire. I took time to check the continuity between the two ends of the coil. Remember, the coil will pass DC, so that was easy to do with my meter. My volt ohm meter has a setting that will ring a tone when there's continuity between the two probes. Sure enough, one of my coils wouldn't ring, so I took my knife and scraped the lead a little more, and then with a little extra touch-up with the soldering iron, I was able to solve that problem. I was glad I came up with the idea of using this little breadboard to line everything up. These pins at the end of the board are going to have to fit into female headers on the main board. So now everything is straight and it should work well. I'll pull this out of here and let you take a look at it. The pins are all nice and straight. The breadboard really worked well. This should work fine when we need to put it on the main board like this. Well that pretty much takes care of the first low pass filter. But before we start putting things on the board, let's take a minute and figure out why we need these filters in the first place. So why do we need a low-pass filter? This little plug-in module here will generate the frequency we want our whisper station to transmit on. It plugs into our main board with all these pins on the back side. We'll set our operating frequency with an ordinary serial connection. No matter what kind of oscillator you use, they all have one problem in common. Although they are designed to oscillate at a particular frequency, we always get a little bit more than we asked for. Here's a page from the Amateur Radio Wikinet that tells us about something called harmonics. The green line here represents the frequency that we're asking our oscillator to generate. We call it the fundamental frequency. And even though we don't ask for it, the oscillator also generates a second frequency that's exactly twice the fundamental frequency. It's called the second harmonic, and we see it in blue here. And if that's not enough, the graph shows us that there's even a third harmonic. This one is at three times the fundamental frequency. Harmonics occur at multiples of the original frequency. The good news is that they tend to be at lower and lower power levels. As you can see by the dial here. My amateur radio is tuned to 14.0956 megahertz. This is the standard whisper frequency on the 20 meter amateur band. 
This is the fundamental frequency. There are filters inside the radio that are designed to block the second harmonic, which is at 28.1912 megahertz. That's twice 14.0956. Years ago, when the powers that be were figuring out how to allocate the amateur bands, they took this mathematics into serious consideration. If a ham with poorly designed homebrew equipment is transmitting on the 20 meter band, his second harmonic will land on the amateur's 10 meter band. The same is true of 80 and 40 meters and 40 and 20 meters. Because our fundamental frequency is always lower than the harmonics, we can build a low pass filter. We can let the frequency that we want roll through and block the frequencies that are going to cause us trouble. Well, we've covered a lot of ground in this second video in our series. We've built some coils, we've talked a little bit about theory and harmonics. In the next video, we'll start building the Whisper Transmitter. I hope you'll join us again. And hey, don't forget to subscribe, like, and share.